Okay. So, hi everyone. <laughs> um, oops. Here we go. So, I know. Thank you for coming out to our program tonight on um, creating a healthy backyard with native plants. We're so glad that you're here tonight, um, both here and on Zoom. And um, we are really excited about this program. We actually worked with Allison a number of years ago. She gave a TED talk here at our library back when we did TED talks. It was a really exciting day. And the TED talk has just been viewed so many times. Um, it's, been, it's really phenomenal. So kind of some of the material um, I'm sure she'll be talking about. But anyhow, if, you are, if you're into TED Talks, you can go on to TEDx Vernon Area Library and find her talk. It's, it's terrific. Um, I'm going to mention a couple of programs coming up here at the library that might be of interest to you um, um, over the next few weeks. Um, on Wednesday night, we have a program on tips for getting published. So if you have a novel that's been in your drawer, you might want to um, take a look. Uh, Renee Rosen, who's really a really well-respected Chicago author, is going to be leading this program with us. That's Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. And then on Monday, the 25th, we have a program about Duncan Hines, more than cake mix. And there really was a person named Duncan Hines, and it's about his history and how the company came to be, that kind of thing. And I think she's raffling some goodies off at the end as well. Um, and then finally, we have a program on the 26th at uh, 7 o'clock, The Truth About Deep Dish Pizza and Other Chicago Foods. Um, and Monica Ang, who's like, um, she writes for Axia Chicago, if you subscribe to that newsletter. She's kind of a local Chicago reporter, has reported for WBEZ and the Tribune. And she wrote a book about this. And she'll be here on the 26th talking about her book. So it should be a lot of fun. Um, we have some books here on the table that you could check out at the end if you're inspired by today's topic. And um, for everyone at home, we will be sure to take your questions at the end. So, you know, you can feel free to put your questions into the chat, you know, as you think of them. You don't need to wait um, until the end to put them in. And we are recording today's program. So everyone will get a link to this probably in the next couple of days. So in the meantime, I just want to introduce you to, um, formally introduce you to our guest. Um, Allison Frederick is the Administrative Director of Citizens for Conservation, her t-shirt says that, <laughs> um, which is a volunteer-based organization dedicated to environmental preservation and restoration of the wire biodiversity that once covered northern Northeast Illinois. She had previously worked for the Lake County Forest Preserve for many years as the public affairs manager, and she has a degree in wildlife management from Purdue. So welcome, Allison. Thank you, Roz. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. Thanks for coming out tonight and for those at home tuning in. Um, take me a while to adjust to a microphone. I feel like I have a naturally loud voice, um, so bear with me. But uh, it's great to be here uh, with a group this size. We can certainly be as informal as we want to be. So um, while I do have a script prepared to make sure we hit some major points for everyone, I do also want to know what's helpful for you today. What, what brought you out today? I mean, literally someone raise your hand and, and tell me <laughs> what, what, what do you hope to learn this evening? Okay. What to do with that invasive growth, crawling, spreading through our communities. Great. I have all sorts of things prepared on that topic. Any any other main tips? Anyone here for native landscaping or tips on particular species? Okay, so I'll hit a mix of that tonight. But again, if you want to pause and throw in a specific question, user, you know, um, viewers at home, if you want to use the chat function, right, Roz? Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. She'll curate. Oh, I can come back to um, this zone. Yeah. I think that laptop is doing it. Oh, it could be using the video here. You know what? I'll just finish for one second. Okay. Your, um, camera is not like in its region. Um, yeah, it's not video there. And okay. you, now can you try sharing your slides? Yes. Yeah. Go back to that. Um, this might be the one <laughs> at this so point. But now I know how to turn off the view that we didn't like. How's that look? Does it have to find me again? Okay. Camera's back on. That's good. Okay. Get the presentation back up. How's that? Better? Yeah. Okay. Great. 
Let me see. Very good. Well, slide number one gives you a little glimpse into my backyard and what I did this summer and have done every year since starting to tackle buckthorn in my own backyard. So if you came here, you're battling buckthorn or some other invasive in your backyard, trust me, if you live in Illinois, you've probably got one, unless you're on a golf course, and then we'll talk Kentucky bluegrass later and those turf lawns, but um, you have probably are tackling an invasive. So, you know, it's not a one-time deal. It's not first year and you're done with it. Typically you have to keep up after the invasive and then slowly but surely replace it with other things. You want to compete with, you know, whatever you're trying to replace. Same thing with weeds, right? We're always trying to select our favorite. So this is just a glimpse at the color, color code in the top is just a little sketch I did because I like to find a balance of blooms. I like early blooms and late bloomers. And I have um, specifically a very dry yard, um, but some are kind of dry and shaded. So I really kind of make a little chart for myself and decide, look for those specific habitat requirements in the plants I'm choosing, and then kind of map it out, you know, height wise, how I want the garden to look. So these are things that my agency, Citizens for Conservation, is really, really good at. This is what we do. We're a nonprofit land trust and with a number of preserves, 14 to be exact, in the Barrington area. Uh, but we are partners with all of the regional forest preserve districts, um, other partnered efforts like uh, foundations and nonprofits doing the same thing as us, conserving the land, trying to, our tagline is saving living space for living things. And that's precisely what we're trying to do. And in, in taking out invasives that weren't part of Illinois' natural landscape, you're doing just that. Replace it with some natives that used to be here that can benefit the wildlife. And you're starting to make a little necessary oasis in your own backyard. And it truly does matter. Tiny little pocket prairies, you know, in the absence of the big swaths that our wildlife is used to and evolved with, uh, they really do make a difference. Got myself psyched up for this program tonight by just staring at my garden. Um, I started doing so because I saw a number of different bumblebees. They weren't Honeybees, those were there too. Those are from Europe. Um, it's, they're good pollinators, but they're not native pollinators. But I saw a number of native pollinators and started staring, and I'm almost certain I saw an endangered rusty patch bumblebee in my own garden. I have bee balm there. I have milkweed. I have the things it likes. I took a picture to confirm it later, but that's an endangered species, and I have, you know, a very small yard. So my mailbox garden's about this big, maybe twice that for the garden where I saw this bee. It doesn't take much is my point. And so slowly but surely over the years, if you can reduce the invasives and increase the natives in your own backyard, you can, you can do the same. And it, you don't have to invite them back. They'll just find you. So let's uh, talk about one of the big invaders of the area, buckthorn. Has, raise your hand if you've heard of buckthorn before, European buckthorn specifically. Okay, so everyone in the room has heard of this creature. Okay, that's good. So we won't start from scratch here, but it is important to kind of know a little bit about where it came from. Sorry, I've got a calendar view popping up over things. Don't know how to get rid of it. There. Okay. This is buckthorn. Uh, whether people know it or not, this alien invader is in your community. It might not be in your backyard. It might not be in your library's yard, but it's somewhere in your community. Sometimes you'll see some pictures later. It's just trimmed as a hedge. Well, that may be fine in Europe, but here in North America, it makes a big change fast. So here on the right is what we would call the glamour shot of buckthorn. It's in someone's backyard. It's being mowed around. It's being trimmed like an average tree. That thing is massive. On the left is more likely what you're to see in an open natural area or an individual tree. Let these things grow over time and it just becomes a thicket, an infestation. And we'll talk over the evening about why that matters, why it's not the greatest thing. Uh, what in the world's happening here? Where did buckthorn come from? How long has this problem been going on? Well, European buckthorn was first brought to North America in the 1800s. So this is my funny little picture of it coming along the trip with the early settlers. Why did they bring it? You know, some notes suggest that it was brought because it was a natural hedge over there. 
you know, you're facing this new frontier, you have no idea what you'll need, you know you want to be an agriculture or a farmer here, this is what you know, you bring it with you. Um, many of our invasives, if they didn't come here accidentally by ship ballast or, you know, on the wind or on some clothes, they were purposely brought here for garden purposes, ornamental purposes, privacy, et cetera, and that's the case with buckthorn. So as early as the 1800s, it made its way to the East Coast, and that's where the problem began. Ever since, it's been spreading East, East, Northeast, all the way up into Manitoba, into the Central Plains at this point. It doesn't go too far South, but it is in Indiana, in Southern Illinois, and still spreading. So if you're familiar with the South, kudzu is the issue there. Um, we have some vines up here too, but buckthorn's kind of our kudzu. It's the thing blanketing everything, choking out native ecosystems, choking out your own backyard from beauty. It's not this glorious thing with flowers or fall color. It's not very pretty. Um, so it just it just doesn't uh, doesn't have any ornamental value at this point. And what we've learned through research of its impact on local ecosystems is very concerning for our local wildlife. So it's the reason that Citizens for Conservation, local forest preserve districts, and conservationists all over the region are targeting this species particularly. So when I say buckthorn, really you can replace that with any invasive in your backyard. Maybe for you it's Amir honeysuckle, similarly invasive woody species that grows side by side with buckthorn often. Maybe it's autumn olive, maybe it's more like a grass, reed canary grass if you're in a wooded or near wetland area. Um, there are invasives all over, but Buckthorn is a target um, because of its impact in the Chicago region, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. Um, this particular graph is um, stemmed from the Chicago Region Trees Initiative, which is stemmed out of Morton Arboretum. Uh, this was a 2010 uh, census that they ran. They ran one just a couple of years back as well, but has slightly different data, so I don't have quite an apples to apples graph for you. So we'll just going off the 2010 one, you can see buckthorn at the very top. Next is green ash, white spruce. It's not until four down on the list you even see a native species. And then the ones you do see, black cherry, box elder, white ash, these are more of our invasive kind of generalist species. They don't do much for wildlife. Yes, they're an important part of our forest structure naturally here in the Chicago region, but they're not the top ones. Um, it's not until further down the list where you see northern red oak that we have a keystone species or anything of true value for wildlife. Um, when I say keystone species, I mean a species that many other species are dependent upon. Northern red oaks literally host thousands of species from butterflies to other insects to birds during migration. They're very, very important. So that's what we would naturally and um, just historically see in the Chicago region is open oak woodlands or an oak savanna here and there or prairies where the prairie state right so you kind of have those river divides where fire didn't quite reach and so you'll have the more wooded ravines between Lake Michigan and the big rivers and then more prairie in Illinois west of that so northern red oaks um we're one of the dominant canopy covers. Now we're dealing with European buckthorn, and this, this is a serious problem. So 42% is the number for Lake County specifically. I chose that because Vernon Hills is here in Lake County. Um, it is the number one percentage in all of the counties of the Chicago area for buckthorn. So Cook County came in a very close second at 32% for this particular census, but you can guarantee that our efforts to control this beast haven't kept up with the growth of it over time. And so I would wager a bet that current census on the same data, the number would be astonishingly higher, probably 50% plus. So that's, again, overall tree canopy of the Chicago area. Here's that hedge example I mentioned earlier. This is in my own community, Cary, Illinois, um, just a little bit further down 22 there. Uh, it's a particularly lovely road because there's conservation district land, park district land, and the private landowners really have nice open natural oak savannas, although it's mowed in between the trees, still hosting those oaks. But then you get to the golf course edge or, you know, a particular right of way for utilities and you see this treatment of buckthorn. And what happens is 
when you buzz buckthorn down with some sort of mowing, it will come back at you tenfold plus. And so you get this thicket of green. And so that's kind of my thing. And then I talk to communities I hear, but green is good, right? A tree is a tree. No, no, that's not <laughs> my, re my research and Purdue University background taught me that early on. Not all trees are created equal, particularly when you're starting to talk about invasive species and the balance balance of an ecosystem. So is it green? Yes, we're taught from a young age, leaves do good things, leaves hold carbon, trees are good. Buckthorn in our region of the world, not a good thing. So if you see this, what it's doing is it's choking out sunlight. So there's no chance of native species to grow underneath it. We'll dig in really into the chemicals of buckthorn here in a little bit to talk about how these issues start to compound, um, but it's doing terrible things to the soil as well along the way. Yeah, so on the left here, I don't know if this is visible at home, but this cursor, this, so here you have an oak tree. And if you look, pretty sparse leaves. These which should be very broad leaves at this point, but this oak tree is being choked out by this. And here's its big trunk and starting, you know, what's that 30% up the tree, it's got all this hedge of invasive woodiness around it. And it produces this chemical called emodin. So that's all going into the soil beneath it, causing trouble with the leaf litter. Um, on the other side of the road, you can see it too. Although a little further up, you see the sunshine, the conservation district of McHenry County is doing a great job of clearing this area. It's called Felpro wildlife area. If you haven't been, it's really cool. There's a disc golf course, but amazing spring fed ponds. So, you know, we get this mosaic going on in all of our communities just because of the way the land is being used. But my point I hope to drive home tonight is if we all united against this one particular concern, our natural areas would get way better fast. And we've learned enough about conservation to know that might actually combat climate change here at home, or at least the impacts of it. So it really, I think, is worth a great effort to rise up together, golf courses, churches, private lands, park districts, all of us together start choosing some healthier hedges. And that's what Chicago Region Tree Initiative, CRTI, is all about. So when I was with the Forest Preserves, we were very, and they still are, partnered with them. We're partnered with CRTI and the Forest Preserve Districts. And we're all speaking the same language now, using the same materials, recommending the same plants to replace buckthorn and, um, and in hopes that this kind of catches on like recycling did all those years ago. Uh, it, wouldn't, it does take a while. Here's another infestation in a natural area. So this is an example, again, of more maintained. It's a roadway. We have safety concerns in this area. I get it. This is a natural area being infested by buckthorn. So when I say buckthorn, I'm specifically speaking of Ramnus cathartica. There's also Frangula ulnus, uh, which is the glossy buckthorn. You'll find it in the wetter areas. So the spots that European common buckthorn doesn't infest, um, where it's too wet or too open, then glossy buckthorn takes over for us. So in what do you have? A forest preserve district protected by natural lands infested by the neighbors surrounding it and practices over time. And eventually this, another oak tree and hickory being choked out. So it's really everywhere. And unless we rise up against it, it will just grow and, and spread. Uh, but it, it can be tackled. This is a school group doing just that. Uh, I like this picture because it shows us um, a really good time to plan your buckthorn removal efforts fall. So what do we see in this picture? We see a very low understory of solid green leaves. Guess, guess what that is? That is our buckthorn. And then above you see the higher canopy, some golden tones, some oranges, maybe what we're supposed to see in the fall in Illinois. So that's our higher um, canopy of the native trees folding on above, some oaks, some hickories. That's what it should look like this time of fall is the leaves should be dropping. One of buckthorn's greatest 
you know, feats is that it leaves out before everything else. Honeysuckle does the same thing. So that's one of the, one of the ways that it's impacting our ecosystems is it leaves out before the ephemeral wildflowers, before the early green stuff that those insects need first, before they ever have a chance to grow on their own. Buckthorn is leafing out, shading it out. It's not getting the sunlight it needs. And uh, same for the trees. The oaks, oak ecosystems in general are on decline across all of the Northeast United States. This is for this reason and others. Oaks need at least 35% openness, at least to survive. They really prefer like 75% openness in a canopy. So if you can picture 100 pixels, right? And just open up 75 of those, that's what an oak needs to get from the wee little acorn and then seedling stage into a mature tree. Well, when you add invasives, and these invasives can be native species too, in the case of our forest areas. Um, they choke it out before the oaks can ever even get a chance. They never get the sunlight they need in terms of canopy openness. And so you'll see oak seedlings that appear to be seedlings this tall, folks at home, um, and about 12 inches tall, and they can be like 50 plus years old because they're just sitting there waiting for the trees around them to open up. And that's a natural thing. You know, the acorns will drop right there and squirrels scatter them, obviously, and they'll wait for the big old sentinel oak to fall and then it will have its day. But our forest structure isn't allowing that day to ever come because of all this thick, thick infestation of invasive species. So what do folks like me do? We join nonprofit agencies all about conservation and we tackle it all day and every day. We talk to folks like you who care about the same and we try and spread that message in hopes that you will also and that the word gets out enough of it um, that we start to really make a difference here. So uh, my agency, Citizens for Conservation, we host volunteer work days every Thursday and Saturday from 9 to 11 a.m. So people know exactly where to find us and what we'll be doing and people come, you know, come as they can. And preserve by preserve, we're working together to get rid of these invasive species. This particular photo is from the Lake County Forest Preserves. This is one of their environmental programs. So they're doing the same thing with schools um, in that partner agency of ours. So let's talk a little bit more about buckthorn and, you know, why, you know, why is it so bad? Why, why is Allison hitting this so hard tonight, this particular idea? Well, buckthorn produces and retains its leaves earlier and holds them longer. That's the picture I just showed you. So this is robbing the ground layer vegetation of the nutrients that it needs, the sunlight, and therefore it reduces the overall plant, native plant diversity and abundance on the forest floor. Um, buckthorn reproduces rapidly and far earlier than most trees and shrubs, meaning it will produce berries very young in its life versus, say, you know, a native apple tree or a black cherry it takes a while to mature um, oaks we just talked about. So you have all of these deliciously glossy berries that are attracted to wildlife. Each one of these holds numerous seeds, and you can see how many on, you know, just one little picture of a, of a single tree. And so this is perpetuating the problem, this abundance of seeds and how early it starts to reproduce. Um, add to it that it has very little to no nutritional value for wildlife and we're in really big trouble. So here's a native warbler. It needs to bulk up on nutrient dense food and fats and amino acids for its long flight wherever it's headed, Central America, South America. And uh, what's it stocking up on? This, you know, the look of the, the branch tells me this is late fall and it's hitting up the buckthorn berries. And so it, it has... Um, it has chemicals in it that just pass through the bird very quickly. So not only does that extirpate, exacerbate the problem by spreading the seeds quickly, but the bird's getting very little wildlife or nutritional value as well. And so this is aids in its proliferation across this landscape, this, this tummy trouble that the birds get. Um, additionally, buckthorn uh, produces uh, something called emodin. That's what I mentioned earlier. It's a chemical compound that protects buckthorn plants and fruits from pathogens, but it deters native wildlife from eating it. 
So if you start to really think about what that's telling us, um, it's very it's very tricky. So there's nothing that you know is here in terms of native wildlife that's going to control you know in terms of herbivory this this particular plant. And this chemical also inhibits the growth of nearby plants and microorganisms. That's why I'm sharing this dark photo. So this, if you picture me crawling under that thicket you saw roadside earlier and under, looking at the ground floor beneath it, this is the very bare soil that you fought, will find under a dense patch of buckthorn. Uh, so what's happening here? This, this chemical, emodin, is inhibiting the growth of everything. And um, the buckthorn has a higher nitrogen levels than all other non-nitrogen fixing plants. So this causes the leaf litter to decompose more rapidly, which changes the nitrogen levels in the soil and pH levels in the soil. Those, those two factors together leads to these bare soil conditions. And the bare soil conditions uh, weaken the existing plants that are there by exposing their roots. So if you look at this picture, it's a lot of down branches and exposed roots of what, what is there, and that begins to increase the susceptibility for erosion itself. And you start to erode any sort of forest floor or any sort of um, local soils, and you're um, causing a rapid increase in the soil arthropod colonization. So here's the erosion, the icon for erosion coming down, and then all these microorganisms, these arthropod communities come in, colonize it um, to do the same thing. And these guys form the base of the food webs um, that support many mammals and bird species. And um, buckthorn infestations are continue to be exacerbated by this um, because then the soil arthropod communities build up and then they crash and then there's no food left forever for, for the other wildlife. So then all that adds together um, and you get the herbivores. So the insects have crashed and the birds have no insects. The berries that are available in this infestation hurt the bird's stomach, gives it no nutrition. The herbivores be, don't like emodin either. So they're targeting the leftover native species, the deer candy. So in the forest preserves, they look particularly at white trillium. I'm sure you have backyard plants that rabbits and deer love. Um, so they begin targeting it, leaving the buckthorn behind. Buckthorn continues to spread. So it's just this, you know, absolute cycle that continues and has been going since the 1800s, but the infestations, you know, the 70s, they were really forming large colonies, buckthorn. So this just further reduces the biodiversity that's out there, so important for the ecosystem services that we all benefit from. And um, the food plants are reduced by the herbivores, the animal populations therefore decline, and it's just an unsustainable cycle overall. So all that to say, buckthorn is the worst of them all. Um, research has showed its impacts far beyond the list I just showed you um, into amphibian populations. If you're a lover of toads and frogs and tadpoles and salamanders like I am, um, the emodin in our wetter forested areas where buckthorn is, is impacting larval growth development as well. So then now you're talking about the mosquitoes, right? We need those salamander larvae, the frog larvae to eat the mosquitoes and control this natural population cycle, but they're being impacted and we're seeing deformities in those populations because of the emodin and so forth. So Really, no matter what avenue you go down with buckthorn and researching it, it's just, it doesn't belong here and it's causing drastic changes. So, you know, why do groups might, like mine speak out about it? Here's a good example. On the left is your average preserve where you've got hardworking volunteers, work crews. Maybe in the case of this particular owner, you've spent millions to get it taken out and controlled. Um, but then, your neighbor on the other side doesn't know what buckthorn is and you have this infestation. Well, what's gonna happen? The berries will always be coming back over into your side. So this is such a stark picture to me to say, you know, why we all have to be involved in this. It will, we could reduce it, reduce it. You get one holdout like this and the berries are coming right back in. But again, the left side shows you it can be eradicated. You know, it takes different applications and resources, depending on the type of land we're talking about, but it can be done and it, it really is a community issue. 
So this is a citizens for conservation example, show you how long we've been working at it. Um, if you can see in there, the color code is shows you 2017 through 2022, specifically brush removal. So that in this preserve is buckthorn and honeysuckle being removed parcel by parcel throughout. So it's not a one and done thing. Um, even if you have a small thicket in your backyard, you'll get those re-sprouts for a few years and you really have to have patience, right? You have to know that you have a few years ahead of you to tackle this thing. And then you don't really wanna put too many expensive replacements in until you've tackled it because you don't wanna lose your healthy hedges along the way. So it does take some strategy and some repeated efforts, um, but this, except for one little patch of re-sprouts we're hitting with herbicide this week, um, this particular preserve is very, very close to having buckthorn removed. And we talk with the neighbors and we show them what they've done. Look, we discovered an orchard back here. And did you know you had a wetlands? Look at these ducks. And then they, we invite them to join a work day and we just spread, spread the love right into their property surrounding us. So that's, that's our goal in outreach um, specific to brush removal. Another solid example that it can be done. Um, on the left, we have an oak woodland suffocated by buckthorn completely. Clear that all out, you know, in one winter season with some volunteers. And aha, on the other side is a heron rookery and a wetlands that is now um, further protected and further helpful to our, our native wildlife. Backyard home landscape example, which is a good, I like to, you know, make it not sound fatalistic, like there's no hope. Yes, buckthorn's everywhere. Yes, it's infested. Yes, it has emodin, but we can do it. <laughs> you know, backyard by backyard, it can be done. I've been working at mine about six years, got the buckthorn pretty much done. I'm just re-sprouts now. I'm pulling the native landscaping back in. Natives themselves, if that's why you're here today, require patience too. They're not going to be this glorious blooming thing in year one. In your garden, they'll take you know, two, three years, sometimes more to really blossom and to really fill in some space. Um, so there's really no wrong way to do it. And cultivars, landscaping plants, they can be beneficial too. Um, Citizens for Conservation specifically focus on native landscape because that's what we're all about. We know that the native wildlife here requires it. Um, carbon sequestration, water filtration, water quality. Um, you know, in Barrington, we're on aquifers. Over here, I don't remember if it's Lake Michigan, but you get the point. Like, water quality matters. And this is one way to start in your own backyard and improve it. Rain gardens, paths that are surrounded by native wildlife, um, that all contributes to the greater ecosystem services and benefits we provide. This particular, just to give her credit, this is Imami Itani's backyard um, in Skokie, Illinois. She was kind enough to share her photos. Um, I meet her at our plant sales and uh, she's obviously been at it a few years, but she's got quite a little haven. She gave us a whole set of photos of all the different species that visit these different flowers and she's got some serious diversity. This is probably 10 year worth of work in this picture and she's still going strong so it started with a turf lawn I should say um so how do you do it first you have to know do you have a buckthorn infestation do you just have a few plants if buckthorn's not your issue I can certainly help you with any invasive species questions tonight um but since buckthorns are focus this is kind of an id slide and I can this will be recorded so you can go back to it or I can send this as uh, visuals if that's helpful to anyone here. Um, but infestation is upper left. That's another hedge type example. Uh, it has a very interesting leaf pattern. It's um, sub opposite technically. So if you know much about trees or branching patterns, you've got your maples, which are opposite and ash. You've got one branch growing straight across, same node as the other. Your oaks are alternate. You've got one branch, a little bit of stem, your other branch down here, that's alternate. Buckthorn tries to trick you, it has both. It's called sub opposite. So you have to look at the whole branch. It's always a good idea in tree identification anyway. Look at the whole branch. If you're seeing some alternate, some opposite and a little kind of looks like a buck's hoof or a buckthorn and a fake thorn at the end, you're dealing with buckthorn. So the leaf pattern, sub opposite, there are the glossy fruits. Very important thing to know about buckthorn is there are male plants 
and there are female plants. Female plants produce the fruits. That's one of your top ways if you're dealing with an infestation to at least stop its spread. Target the fruit bearing trees first. Now is a great time to see it through fall. Um, they're green right now and they'll darken into these beautiful glossy bluish purple berries that are worthless to everything around them. And um, you'll be able to flag those trees and really those will retain into the winter. So if you hit those trees first, get them out of there, try not to let it fall, you know, burn, bucket up and burn it. Um, then at least you're reducing the spread by berries and that proliferation. So if you really got an infestation, that's a great tip. Um, on the lower part of this slide, you're seeing the bark, it changes with age. So a very young, tree is going to look more like that very lower right picture. You see how it's kind of silvery, glossy, it has some horizontal lines on it. That's what the young bark is going to look like. Um, but then it starts to get flaky and um, just kind of scaly with age. It's overall unattractive, very little pattern. Um, so again, it's good to look at all these uh, characteristics for identification. So uh, Look, looking for the berries now, if you know you have buckthorn is good, flag those for later. Go out in the fall when, if you're not sure at all, see what's retaining its leaves. If it's still green in October, when your other tree, you know, love, beloved trees are, are, have lost their leaves, chances are it's an invasive of some sort. And um, whether it's buckthorn or not, it might be good for consideration to replace it. Um, but fall is a great time to flag all those trees and make it a fun family adventure this winter, have a bonfire, roast some marshmallows over it at the end. Um, the bigger the group, the better. You can really surprisingly clear a decent patch um, in just a few hours with a solid group. You, like if you guys came to my backyard, we'd be, we'd finish my little patch this winter, no problem. So it really just takes, uh, you know, a bow saw, if you have it, a chainsaw for the bigger stuff and um, just kind of keep on tackling it. It does require herbicide. So that is one of the things. You can't just cut down buckthorn and leave it. It will grow back thicker. You must herbicide this plant. The best one um, is uh, Garlon 4A, and it's a systemic herbicide. You paint it on the cut stump. It's available commercially. You don't have to have a license to apply it in your own backyard. And um, if done in the winter, applied in the right way based on the label, then it's not gonna impact anything you're trying to protect around it. It'll just go down into the system of roots and take that one plant out. Doesn't always tackle it. Buckthorn's tricky, tricky. Um, so you want to go back spring after spring, check for re-sprouts. You can paint it right on the re-sprout, kind of keep up with it. But once you've cut it and herbicided it, that plant will start to decline and just kind of whatever your issue in the backyard is, just kind of work through it that way. Um, Garlon 4A, uh, that's for winter use and specifically not in wetland areas. It's not, um, that particular one is not good in wetlands. So if you have any sort of wet yard, then you're um, in round, the Roundup territory. So Roundup does work on it, um, but some people have issue with Roundup, uh, but however, it is also effective against buckthorn. There's not too much else that's, that's very good at it. You'll hear things like bag it with a black bag and wrap a rubber band or burn the stump really hard, no. Buckthorn just laughs at you. <laughs> so it does require the cut and apply herbicide treatment. Um, if it, you have tiny stuff after that, you know, you do have berries. It's starting to re-sprout up to about the size that these smiling kids are holding. Um, it can be pulled out by the roots, but it does, you can see how dense that root system is. It gets any bigger than that and it's, it's impossible. Um, but if you have an infestation and you're not, too concerned about natives that might be resting in the soil beneath it, then you can have a more mechanical or um, disturbing approach like pulling it out by the roots. Um, but if the lower right picture is more typical using loppers for the small stuff. That's the you know heavy duty pruning shears. Cut it off um, very level, parallel with the ground, about this high. If this is the ground, about this high, cut your stump and then just paint the herbicide right on that. 
And so about the size of your thumb, you can tackle it with a good pair of loppers, anything bigger than that. I use a bow saw, um, chainsaw for the bigger, bigger stuff, certainly. Um, but not everyone has that around. So really just kind of, if you don't, just kind of work it down, down, down with a bow saw as low as you can go herbicide it and keep up with it. And that trunk will kind of, you'll be able to kind of loosen it up over time. But I'm here to tell you it works. It can, it can be successful. You just have to keep at it. This is my office every day. Isn't she lovely? It's an old protected farmhouse at Flint Creek Savannah Preserve um, owned by Citizens for Conservation. And these are just a few examples of our tiny little walkway native garden headed up to the house. So this was literally taken yesterday, the picture on the left. And it just shows the glorious blooms that are, you know, happening. And the people who designed this uh, particular garden are just so savvy. So that's something CFC can help any one of you with. If you want to send me an email after, I'd be happy to um, help you individually with yards. We have a program um, that is currently kind of on pause, um, but it aligns with our native landscaping and we can have uh, a consultant come out to backyards. Um, if it's outside of our Barrington area, if it's not, if you're not a member of CFC, then there's a small fee. Um, but uh, it's a great program to have a direct consultant or by email, we can really get pretty far even without that. Um, but again, just to kind of show you that all through the year, we've designed it. So there's something blooming. The first thing, first thing up is kind of, you know, prairie smoke and Virginia bluebells you know, carpet all of this. And then you've seen Virginia bluebells, they go eh, after too long at all, but it doesn't matter. You know, other things are popping up. Um, this picture lower middle is a plant called pussy toes. If you're not familiar with it, um, if you look, I don't know the best way to, um, in this format to circle, but if you see my cursor circling here, this is like, a, it looks like a little cat paw almost up on a long stem. That's Pussy Toe's beautiful flower. And so people like it. Um, it stays very low, like a ground cover. So if you have an area like a small garden path like this, um, did it <laughs> lose me again? Um, Pussy Toe's is a, a really good one. And it hosts the painted lady butterfly. So that's what this hand is doing is they were showing me, um, let's look for painted lady caterpillars. And they were opening up these folded leaves of the Pussy Toe and multiple have painted lady caterpillars just hanging out in there. Above it, of course, is the beloved and well-known uh, monarch caterpillar. So the upper center the middle picture here is uh, a monarch on milkweed in the same garden. The whole life cycle is of a monarch is hosted and dependent upon milkweed, any, any milkweeds. Asclepius is the species. This is common milkweed, but there's butterfly, rose milk, milkweed. There's something for any garden. And um, the monarch specifically needs it for the caterpillar. So the while the monarch adult, you'll see you know, feeding from many nectar sources, the caterpillar specifically munches on um, milkweed plants. And that's what uh, gives it, it has this bright color to warn off predators. Hey, I've been eating this toxic sap, I'm toxic. And um, which is great for nature as a whole, but when you start taking away that native diversity and you don't have milk, you know, milkweed as ubiquitous as it once was, then you be, you see a species in decline. And that's what, exactly what we've seen with the monarch, which is now on some endangered species lists and why it, it's, you know, so hot in the news right now. Uh, so there's just, again, a, an example of a space, you know, one third of the size of this room that's hosting all these native pollinators. We have recorded the rusty patch bumblebee here. Um, bird species use it. Um, and it really, it, any, any space can really make a difference. So I'll leave you with this cute little fella um, and just a reminder of what one small space can do and uh, handle any questions that you might have um, that can help you along a similar journey. This is a, what an oak savanna once looked like. Lots of diversity, no dense thicket underneath, lots of sun reaching the ground, many different uh, flower species still late into the summer. Uh, this is what we're going for. Any questions here or at home? Allison, we, we do have a question from somebody um, who's watching on Zoom, and they want to know other, other towns or other counties or the state 
engaged in removing buckthorn. Yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, conservationists everywhere. If you're in the Midwest or the eastern part of Canada and you're in the natural resource game in any way, you're either talking about buckthorn or tackling it. Um, move further west and it's going to pick up on a different species like an olive or a mesquite or something else. But every, every agency, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, Indiana, Wisconsin, Minnesota, no joke, are all teamed up against buckthorn. It's um, If they're doing land management of any sort, invasives is typically the first step. You learn what's in the land, you learn what it used to be by soil, by water samples, and then you figure out what's growing there now. If it's invasive, you start by removing it. Um, typically, especially in this area of the country, you start to bring controlled burns, prescribed fire back onto the landscape absolute um, part of our natural areas that has been haha, extinguished um, in recent decades for our own human safety. But, you know, for these oaks uh, to keep this canopy, to reduce weediness, to keep areas open, reduce the fuel loads, um, fire was an absolute essential part of life. And um, so these are, you know, some of the major management techniques that help restore land back to closer to what it used to be, bring diversity back, is removal of invasives. So there's not an agency out there who's not working on buckthorn. The idea is to get private landowners involved too, because here in the Chicago area, over 70% of the land is held privately. So you hear the Lake County Forest Reserves have 31,000 plus acres. Small places like me have 700 to 10,000 acres and add that all up together and we're still only 30% of the land protected as natural area. The rest is on you guys and me and our backyards. And uh, so that's why we're trying to engage communities and make it a larger effort um, on, on for the greater good. There's another question. Um, someone wants to know other what are native plant options for a heavily shaded yard to replace buckthorn? Yeah, so um, it depends on what you're going for and what your soils are. But I would highly recommend um, if you have privacy concerns at all, or um, you just generally like shade and uh, like that sort of structure, that native shrub would be good. So it's hard to you know, start listing specific shrubs. Um, best thing is to find a resource or a list of them. Uh, I can share one with Roz after that can be posted. Um, something that I helped develop when I was with the Lake County Forest Preserves is called Healthy Hedges. It's a brochure and or poster that really kind of lists by habitat type um, some recommended replacements. So if you're replacing buckthorn and you liked what it did for you, like privacy, then I would recommend finding a native shrub that would work. One of my favorites that works in pretty much every habitat is witch hazel. I adore it. It has a beautiful leaf. It is the last bloomer in the area. Um, you can actually use it for an astringent on your face if you're so savvy. Um, it's an absolutely amazing and beautiful plant. It grows, you know, to small tree size, but really fills out like buckthorn does, but it's aiding the wildlife and it's giving you tiny little beautiful yellow flowers just in time for Thanksgiving and you can't beat that. So that's just one example of many. Um, what type of soil do you have? Does it hold water? Does it drain well? Is it sandy? Is it clay? There are a number of resources out there to help you answer these things. Um, and then start looking for the native shrub or ground cover or sedge that um, can go in, and, and really thrive in that sort of yard. Anything here in the audience? I'll, I'll ask some more because the people at Zoom are asking. <laughs> All right, great. Okay. So they're asking about volunteer opportunities. It sounds like your organization does do that. Is it twice a week there's volunteer opportunity? Can you yes. just kind of remind us of that? Yeah. So on our website, um, which is citizensforconservation.org, we have, you can sign up for our workday emails. So quite often, especially in the summer, we are at Flint Creek Savannah. If we go to one of our other 13 preserves, then we usually meet at Flint Creek Savannah and carpool there. It's uh, for sure twice a week, but we're part of uh, an amazing regional effort called the Barrington Greenway Initiative, which is trying to protect two specific watersheds in this area, kind of um, south, 
uh, and adjacent to the Fox River. And um, so Lake County Forest Preserves, Cook County Forest Preserves, Bobbling Foundation, they're, these are all partners in this Barrington Greenway initiative. And so I say all that because we CFC teams up with these as well. So we'll take our volunteer corps kind of on the road, if you will, and we'll go to Grassy Lake Forest Preserves, um, Cuba Marsh Forest Preserve, and we'll team up with these um, greater initiatives. Um, at CFC, we're all about seeds. That's our currency. We have some of the rarest seeds, We've and um, especially in terms of prairie remnants. And so we like to barter too. So we'll, you know, forest preserve is kind of looking for a particular species. We'll give them our seed or we'll help prep a site for them. Um, we even have uh, shared uh, staff with one of them. So we're very, um, we're very community friendly and collaborative in that way. And so I say all this to tell you that we don't mind what work that you go to. They're all out there. We have um, this group, the Spring Creek Stewards. They're kind of an offshoot, not a nonprofit, just kind of a volunteer corps, absolutely devoted to Spring Creek Forest Preserve owned by the Cook County Forest Preserve District. Um, and then we have partners just down the street at Grassy Lake Forest Preserve, which is Lake County, and they host work days like every day of the week. And Lake County as a whole has stewards all over the county, and you can just kind of find a forest preserve near you and see when their active work days might be. And you don't have to travel far to, to join in. These are great ways to just pitch in a couple hours, get some exercise and bend the ear of these professionals who are doing it absolutely all the time. You can really learn a lot for your own backyard um, in doing so too. So yeah, there are lots of ways to, to volunteer. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Um, this particular uh, shot is from a southern slope that I did. It's off of uh, my back deck, uh, which kind of stands high above it. And so it's kind of it was an unusual area. You can tell um, no one's ever done anything with it. The construction folks just kind of threw a bunch of riffraff rocks there. And um, I'm particularly on a gravel hill prairie. I told you my yard is very, very dry. That is why I'm on, you know, underneath me is glacial gravel hill. And so it's very sandy, very rocky. Any tree I've ever planted, like it needs one of those, you know, slam bars to <laughs> pivot all the rocks out. Um, so I was working with all these rocks in a very well-drained, very sunny area. So I knew I needed lots of prairie species, very um, species that could really take the heat. And I was also hoping to do some erosion control on that side. So I went for a mix of uh, very large prairie plants. Silphium is the genus. Um, so you can't quite see it in my diagram. Oh, you can, you can see cup plant written there. So I put in some cup, cup plant and compass plant, um, which have just roots that go feet, 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 feet down into the soil um, eventually over time. So they're kind of the backdrop of this garden. I put in two New Jersey tr shrub trees, um, which I'm going edible over long, long time. So that's at literally a tea species that's native to this area. Um, trick with that one is deer love it. I haven't had much luck with it because they chomp it these two shrubs they haven't found yet, <laughs> but I know eventually I'll probably have to fence off this garden and keep them away just to establish them. Once they're established, the deer can have whatever they want. That's part of my game here is to provide, you know, deer, coyote, rabbits with more wildlife while also enjoying it. So just while they establish, do I you know, cage things off, but New Jersey tea. So that's kind of my lower shrubbery. I wanted to stay real low with that one. I've got a low early blueberry bush, which is just what it sounds like. It blooms and fruits early. It stays very low to the ground and it's native to this area and edible. So edible for the native wildlife, edible for me. And then along the front is my favorite part of this whole thing. You see stone crop written a bunch. That is a very low native sedum. If you have sedum in your garden, it uh, looks just the same. It has this beautiful, though, like fuchsia tinged edge of the leaves and a really kind of sage uh, leaf. It stays real low and it, it's a great ground cover. So I kind of am using that along the edge of the rocks. And then <laughs> what I did basically was scraped all the rocks off of this pile that they just, you know, from the early construction of the house 
set it all aside. I used, um, I get occasionally those meal subscription boxes that come in that Climacel brown paper packaging, if you've ever seen it to insulate, you know, cold food product. Um, I used it um, as a base. So I scraped all that off, got it down to the soil level, put that Climacel on top. You could do the same with thick newspaper or cardboard boxes. I put soil right on top of that compost on that, plants in and mulched it, and it's doing great. It won't probably be until next year or the year after that I really see the cup plants and the, um, the compass plant bloom and get high. But eventually, I'm expecting them to get about eight feet high and have these beautiful clusters of um, yellow flowers for my birds, and it'll be right about deck height. It's a very, very tall prairie plant, and I have a particular spot to put it. Um, and then uh, what else is in there? Oh, I, some purple prairie clover and uh, showy black eyed Susan. So that is my very stony, very bright uh, prairie garden example for you. On the flip side of my house, the north side, it gets, we're on a hill. And so the house north of us totally shades our north side of the house. So there it's, it's a little different. The topsoil is built up different. It's a, it's a more moist soil and it's 100% shady. So there's my shade garden with ferns, sedges, jack in the pulpit. Uh, I put in prairie trout lily this year. Um, and then it kind of edges out into a sunny yard. And so there I kind of started um, bringing in some shrubbery. I planted an elderberry tree and um, butterfly bush in that zone and um, some native mint. So, yeah. What kind of yard are you hoping to landscape? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Great, excellent diversity. So got some sedges, some early bloomers like the anemone, uh, some later bloomers, bergamot, you said bee balm, um, that's monarda. Uh, that's a wonderful pollinator species. So from bumblebees to hummingbirds to the endangered rusty patch bumblebee, that's an excellent yard species. It'll do really well in shade or in open areas and it grows about this high. It's one that can kind of take over. So if you have a area you don't quite want to shrub, maybe you don't want plants there all year long, um, bee balm can kind of fill a space nicely and um, has lovely foliage too. And it's blooming right about now and will persist into, you know, into mid-August probably. And I even like its seed heads. They look like little salt shakers. So that's, that's an easy one to share. If you have bee balm, and too much of it, you can break it off and share transplants. Um, if you have someone who absolutely adores it, share it with your neighbors. You can just, you know, shake the seeds out, right out into an envelope. So that's a really good way to get quote, free plants. Um, some of these natives grew up around here, right? That's why they do so well. That's why we speak on them all the time. They evolved here. So, you know, you have a drought year like this you have a super wet year, you have a wild winter, it's going to survive it and do just fine. And with no fertilizer or health of any sort, um, you don't even have to trim them if you don't want to, because, you know, things like carpenter bees and tiny little minor bees love monarda at the end of year. So keeping those deadhead, um, avoiding deadheading things and leaving those winter seed heads on there it is very helpful too. Um, so it sounds like you have a great mix. But uh, shady spots can be hard. It kind of depends on, you know, what, what you're going for um, and if you're in a small space. But it sounds like you have a really good mix of wildflowers and, and sedge and shrub. Great. Great job. It, Yeah, I completely agree. It's taken me a long time to fill it out. And I, I, do, I do have some non-native 
fruit trees <laughs> and uh, you know I mentioned slowly going edible over time so that takes a long time to establish these things and doesn't take much. Mm hmm. Yeah, but but you use the phrase every now and then some buckthorn shows up in the garden right so that's that's what we're going for is it ever going to be fully gone. I hate to say no, but it's that would be a wild effort wouldn't it if we got rid of it entirely over here, um, so I think we can expect it, but if you just see it every now and then that's a lot easier to handle than an entire thicket of it absolutely yeah. Huh. Are willow and sunflower native? Yes and yes. Um, it depends, though. I'm sure you've seen willows that are not native, however. So there are things like prairie willow and um, what's commonly known as weeping willow. Those are native species, absolutely. There are also willows that have been cultivated or changed or brought in from other parts of the country because they you know, have particular foliage or whatever. Um, Pussy willows kind of right at the edge of that. Um, but yeah, they're absolutely native willows, uh, sunflowers as well. Helianthus is the genus of sunflowers, and we have lots of native helianthus species in this area. Now, the Russian sunflowers, the big ones, the ones you see in the Dakotas that we love the seeds of, those are not native, but there are cousins to those large beasts that are native to here in Illinois. So if you like that look, there's a wide diversity of those. In fact, you know, going through school, you're like, yeah, that's sunflower. I don't <laughs> there are so many, it's hard to identify, like um, goldenrod, um, the asters, like heath and New England aster. You really have to look very close at those species to tell them apart, but there are lots of options. So again, that, that that's helpful because there's so many different yard types out there. So it's, we're, you know, there's, there's definitely a native plant suited to your yard. Yeah. Yeah. I see a clue out there pinks on their back. What are they, in the, especially in a meadow, what are they doing? What are the crews with tanks on their backs doing out there? Yes, <laughs> they're likely herbiciding something. So this time of year, um, what my agency is focusing on is reed canary grass control. Uh, that's another invasive species. Uh, it targets more of the open areas, the wet areas. You'll see it along most stream banks and wetlands in the area. Again, that's reed canary grass. It's, I believe, a Eurasian species um, that really has taken over kind of especially in agricultural areas that have gone back natural or left fallow. It'll move in there. Um, it seems like it's doing real good things growing along the bank of a stream, like it might be helping with erosion control. It's actually doing the opposite because its um, root structure, structure is not built for that. So it just kind of, the population grows, grows, grows until the stream bank collapses. And uh, if it's in a wooded area, it's doing the same thing as these woody invasives we talked about today. It's um, shading out the species beneath it, like those milkweeds we talked about, the sedges that are, grow lower in wet areas. Um, so the backpack sprayers, the individual ones, is one of the easier ways to get out in a spot where you can't get equipment, perhaps, or you don't want to. You want very specific, careful application, um, plant by plant. Then the best way to do that is by wick or glove application and literally carrying it on your back and going out there um, with a glove on glove method or some otherwise sponge applying it to the plants out there. Hoses, yeah. Yeah, so it, de it depends. Sounds like they were kind of spraying a big area then. Um, it's or bigger patches. Maybe they weren't kind of, sometimes you'll see people going like this with the backpack sprayer on and they'll like spray their glove and they'll go like this. Um, so what they're doing is, you know, they have like a triple glove thing and on the outside's a cotton one. And so they're saturating that and then allows them to go stem by stem and get Phragmites. So that's that tall, reed you see it a lot along the expressways around here it's got the big fluffy seed head it's real pretty um so invasive and uh so that's one of the backpack sprayer targets as well so that's probably what they're doing yeah so land management changes throughout the seasons this time of year 
specifically CFC, we're collecting seeds. So some of the very early bloomers in the spring are already producing their seeds and we gather that and put it right back into our restoration projects. So we're doing that throughout the summer, species by species. Um, we're using herbicide to um, either hit up the re-sprouts of the areas where we cut buckthorn last winter or hitting areas with things like reed canary or phragmites. Um, this is the perfect time for it. Here in a little bit, we're going to shift gears to cattails. Uh, we see those everywhere. Love to think that they're native. Um, mostly they're not. They're a hybrid variety that's just absolutely decimating wetland areas. So that takes control. So in our Barrington Bog Preserve, um, it's just infested with cattails. So we got an amazing grant last year for some equipment um, to get out there and tackle it. And so um, herbiciding summer things like that is um, kind of in balance with seed collection. In the fall, we shift to even more seed collection and then processing that seed and putting it into mixes and sowing it. And then um, we do prescribed fire in, in the spring and the fall. And then winter is almost exclusively clear, clearing these invasive brush. Um, the reason being that all plants are dormant at that time and typically the ground is frozen. So when you're getting in there with any sort of heavy equipment or a big group, you're causing less damage to the soil, less compaction of the soil at that time of the year. And it's the most effective time to apply these particular herbicides. So you'll get the best treatment if you can get out there in the winter year, winter months and um, tackle the woody invasives. And then it starts all over again in spring with some hand pulling of garlic mustard and collecting those seeds again. So just kind of an idea of the seasonality and all the different things you could do for groups like ours and team up. So if chainsaws and bow saws aren't your thing, um, you know, we're planting seeds and collecting seeds as well and, and gentle projects. Great. Any other questions? Okay. Mm -hmm. Could be. Um, I've yet to see a pack that has fully native or at least fully native to this area. Closest I came had some Texas stuff in it too. Um, but if it's a good seed pack, it'll have the species listed in there, and it's pretty easy to check there. Check that. Um, the Illinois wildflowers is an excellent information source online. Um, it, it goes by habitat, so you know you kind of have to know if it's a woodland plant or a prairie plant. But it will have excellent species information there, and that's a great place to see its range. The USDA obviously has excellent um, species range maps as well. So if you find a seed packet or you're gifted one at a carnival, wherever you might get it, um, it's pretty easy to cross check those with the natives. But again, I haven't found one commercially packaged at least to do that. You might get lucky and find a small group like mine giving out milkweed seeds or, or something else that we know is vetted. Um, but the packs usually stay away from them. Online too, you have to be really careful. There are things that are packaged absolutely incorrectly. Amazon in particular, um, I've heard so much about people being offered free plants from Amazon and it's some sort of weird scam and they were all invasive species and people start planting them. So just be wary of, you know, things like that <laughs> and, and shopping online in general. Look for that species name. That's why um, I said Ramnus cathartica earlier. If you Google buckthorn tonight, you might see sea buckthorn come up and all these wonderful facial um, products, you know, that is a different buckthorn. <laughs> so Ramnus cathartica, you want to speak Latin sometimes and make sure that you're targeting the right species, that you're planting the right species, because common names are all over the place for sure. Right. Excellent questions. I, we're over time, so I'm sure Roz um, wants to close it out, but thanks to all of you for being here. Um, this is my email address on the screen here. It's super easy, allison.frederick at citizensforconservation.org. Literally email me anytime. Um, our phone number is 847-382-SAVE, as in save the living things, and uh, you can call us as well. So we're happy to help as you digest all of this information, or I didn't hit your question tonight. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.